Hi everyone and welcome to this video which will go over Brown and Leveson's face theory which is a really useful theory to be aware of and can be applied to lots of aspects of English language. So today we will cover what are positive and negative face, what is a face threatening act, examples of face threatening acts and face saving acts and how would you write about face theory. In a nutshell then positive face is the desire to be liked and appreciated a negative face is the desire to be independent and not be imposed upon. And a face threatening act is when something threatens our positive or our negative face. Don't worry right now if you're thinking you still don't quite know what that looks like in terms of speaking and writing. But the key thing to remember and the statements I always come back to when I need reminding of the difference between positive and negative face is that if positive face is threatened, we might feel ashamed or embarrassed. And if negative face is threatened, we might feel offended or imposed upon. And I would actually recommend writing these statements down somewhere, maybe with one or two of the examples we're going to look at next to them, just so that you have a reference point to come back to. So starting with positive face then, which as we've said, is the desire to be liked and appreciated and to feel part of a group. All the statements below, which for now we'll imagine are spoken language rather than written, are examples of where you might see someone's positive face being threatened, perhaps because they might embarrass the person you're talking to, they might make them feel ashamed, or potentially another negative emotion associated with positive face. So the first one, Tim is having a party, but he told me he is not inviting you, is quite clearly a face threatening act, as it is purposely excluding someone from a group, going against that want of being liked and included, perhaps with the intention to embarrass them for their perceived lack of popularity. The second example we have, we have two speakers here. We have Nick saying, Maggie's a bit weird, isn't she? And Dan then saying, no, I think she's nice. We'll look at how to write about this one shortly. But again, this response is most likely going to make Nick feel either embarrassed or ashamed of what he has said, or both of these things as Dan refuses to agree with his comment. Our next example, I don't think your work is good enough. This again is a potential face threatening act as it goes against that feeling of wanting to be appreciated, whether it's a piece of work that has taken a lot of time and so you feel upset that it's not good enough, or if it's something the listener hasn't spent time on, so they may feel ashamed or embarrassed. And finally, this last one, I bet you'd never go to festivals we go to, you wouldn't like it. Here the speaker is giving their opinion to the listener and very much excluding them from the group with the statement they are making. And in this case, they might get a defensive reaction from the listener and the statement could cause upset at the assumption that they are different to the group if the statement is being posed as a negative thing. Obviously, as always, context is key and we are just looking at some ex isolated examples here while we get used to this theory. So if we now move on to think about a face saving act, which is saying something to lessen any threat to someone's positive or negative face. We have the same topics as previously, but I've changed the speech around slightly, so they move from being a face threatening act to a face saving act. So the first one, Tim is having a party, but he can only invite 20 guests, so he can't invite you. This now gives a reason behind the lack of invite and the perceived exclusion from the group and won't leave the listener necessarily feeling like they aren't liked or there is anything to be embarrassed about. Example two becomes Nick saying, Maggie is a bit weird, isn't she? So the same as before. Dan then saying, actually, once you get to know her better, I think you'll like her. And now, even though Dan still isn't agreeing with Nick, he's giving a reason for why he might not be right. And so Nick is performing a face saving act by allowing Dan to then change his view or comment over time. The last two you'll notice have now become interrogative statements. If you aren't sure what an interrogative statement is, then please watch my video that goes through different sentence types. So they now read, did you have difficulty understanding the task? And do you think you'd enjoy those types of festivals? So instead of excluding someone from the group or making it feel as if their work is not appreciated, it now gives the listeners more of a chance to respond and therefore stops it becoming a situation where their positive face is potentially threatened. As always, I will spend a section of this video showing you how you can then take what we've gone through and apply it to your writing. So here we have the face threatening act from earlier. Nick saying Maggie's a bit weird, isn't she? And Dan saying, no, I think she's nice. 
And what I focus on in my answer alongside face theory is the idea that gossiping about someone, which is what Nick is intending to do here, is seen as a way of bonding with people because talking about someone else in a negative way can be seen as a taboo, but also implies that you are trusting the person you're speaking to with this opinion. It's something you might look at in more detail if you go on to study gendered language at some point. So this is what I would say about it. Nick intends to engage Dan in, into a conversation about Maggie, using a declarative statement and stating that he thinks she's a bit weird, finishing this utterance with the tag question, isn't she? So to elicit a response from Dan. Nick most likely assumes Dan will agree and they will create a bond through the taboo of gossiping. However, Dan threatens Nick's positive face when he disagrees by saying, no, I think she's nice. This face threatening act leaves Nick potentially feeling embarrassed and ashamed of what he has said about Maggie due to the way Dan has directly disagreed with him. And we can assume the conversation between the two speakers may break down at this point. So this is what I would say. Um, it's quite a short response here, but hopefully it shows you how you can talk about face theory within your writing. We will now move on to focus on negative face, which is the desire to be pen independent and have freedom of action. And if your negative face is threatened, you might feel offended or imposed upon. Again, some examples for you to look at of face threatening acts. This first one is saying, my food is cold. What are you going to do about it? You can imagine this being said in a restaurant, most likely to a waiter who is not the one that has made the food. And this statement is taking away any freedom of action that the listener might have as the question demands an immediate answer, making the listener feel imposed upon. It also, I think, comes across as a little aggressive. Um, the second one you can see, you should call your grandma, here's the phone, do it now, is similar in the fact it takes away the listener's freedom of action, forcing them to do something and imposing an opinion and action on them. Then we have, we're going for a run later, we both need it. Now, here you can definitely imagine someone feeling perhaps a little offended by the idea that they need to go for a run, maybe implying they've put on weight or are less fit than before. And also it takes away their choice in the matter, imposing on them once again. And this final one, thank you in advance for your help, which is uh, probably more likely to be a written communication rather than spoken, potentially in an email. It takes that independence and freedom away from someone by assuming they are going to help with whatever it is without actually asking them if they will or if they want to. Our final section on face saving acts then. And like before, I've taken the statements we've just seen and changed them from face threatening acts to face saving acts. The first one now becoming my food is cold. Would the chef be able to redo it? It's still an interrogative statement but it is now much less aggressive and implies the waiter has a choice with what they do, even though what the speaker wants them to do is very clear. The second example becomes, you should call your grandma this week, um, and just takes away that forceful action the previous example has where they were being handed the phone and told to do it now, giving them that freedom to decide when they do it. Example three, do you want to go for a run together later? I feel like I need it is a classic face saving act where the speaker or writer is making out the listener would be doing them a favour if they came with them. And that it's because the speaker needs to run rather than the listener, taking away any chance of offence and also not imposing on them that they have to go on the run. Now, the final one you may notice is actually the same as the previous example. Thank you in advance for your help. Because as I said earlier, it's so important to remember how vital context is to all examples of face threatening or saving acts. Before we read this as a face threatening act, as it's assuming someone will do what is asked, even if they don't want to. But here you could also read it as a face saving act, as it could be adding a politeness marker at the end of an email, maybe. For example, if a boss were to email someone on their team about their work, but ended it with this, it's seen as a way of appreciating them and acknowledging them with what they're doing. So what I would say is treat every example you see based on the context it is in and above all, use common sense to work out if it's a face threatening act, a face saving act or if it's neither. Our final example today then is how to write about a face saving act. Again, looking back at one of the examples we've just discussed. So my food is cold. Would the chef be able to redo it? And here's what I would say about that. The speaker here attempts a face saving act when talking to a waiter about his disappointing meal. 
He directly states that his food is cold, ending with the interrogative, would the chef be able to redo it? The use of the softer modal verb would makes this question less confrontational than it could be. And by posing this as a question rather than a direct order, it leaves the listener to feel they have a choice in what they say and do next, even if there is only one option which will please the speaker and therefore protects the waiter's negative face. So again, hopefully you can see that's quite a simple, straightforward response, but clearly talks about face saving acts. I've also gone into a bit of detail by uh, picking out a modal verb. If you're not sure what that is, then again, I have a video on this that you can go and refer to as well. So I hope you found today's lesson useful. Face theory did take me a while to get my head around, so I'd recommend watching this video a few times and looking up more examples online if you're still having trouble with it. Please feel free to give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel.